Hello everyone. My name is Rina. I'm the account manager for Geosoft's environmental and UXO clients in North America. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which will focus on how to optimize your workflow in Oasis Montage. As a bit of a background, this workshop was arranged as an alternative to attending the SAGI conference this year to provide the Geosoft community with more access to our training and technical resources. A poll went out to the Geosoft environmental and UXO community with various options and popular vote determined that this online workshop to enhance your workflow would provide most value. The objective of the webinar is to guide you as you learn time-saving shortcuts, how you can automate repetitive tasks with scripts or macros, and to create custom menus so you can customize your workflow. So as part of our team today, we have Dima Amin online. Dima is a geophysical technical analyst for Geosoft and has a background in airborne geophysical surveys. She will be taking care of any incoming questions during today's workshop. Hi, everyone. There, you, there she is. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce you to our main presenter, our senior solution consultant, Darren Mortimer. Darren Mortimer provides training and consulting services as a solution consultant with Geosoft. Prior to being at Geosoft, he was a client for over 15 years as an environmental geophysical consultant working in Europe and North America. Darren has a Bachelor of Applied Science in Geological Engineering from the University of Waterloo. Now, after over four years as, a, as our senior trainer, he truly is one of the world's experts on Oasis Montage. Please welcome Darren Mortimer and enjoy our pictures up there on the screen. Well, thank you, Rena, and uh, welcome everybody into uh, what hopefully is going to be something that um, works out to save you some time in the, uh, in the long run. So just as a reminder, some of the things that we'll be looking at here today is um, some time-shaving uh, shortcuts, uh, some of the ways that you can find out about our shortcut keys in case you um, are like me perhaps and um, forget about them occasionally. How you might be to better uh, work with your databases and save working views and things like map um, snapshots as well. Then we'll um, get into recording some scripts uh, or macros as um, sometimes people like to call them and how that you can use those um, to, to automate or to uh, streamline your process and, and perhaps even put things onto um, your scripts onto a mac or your macro sorry onto a menu um, or being able to just customize the menus so that you can take any of the commands that we've got there for you in your existing menu structures and probably build something the way that you would like it to um, to show in, in your individual workflow. Um, we did send out the data sets beforehand that I will be sort of looking at for some of the things that I was um, going to be showing you here today. So if you wanted to um, follow along, um, you can unzip or extract your data set. I'm just going to close down Oasis. Uh, sorry, not close down Oasis. Uh, close down my PowerPoint. And I've just extracted those files, and I've grabbed a couple other files here for things to show them. I'm just putting them, in my case, on a folder on my C drive that I've just named Webinar, and I just put all that into a data folder. And in that data folder, there was a um, project file, and if you can use that project file, I'll go and create your own project file if you would like. Uh, that was just one that I had sort of created to help people get started when I uh, teach this in case you were, were wanting to follow along. As we mentioned, this will be recorded, so you can go, always go back and watch the recording later. So to start off with some uh, uh, tips, is some of the advanced configurations. Often people have come to me at either shows or at um, some of the training events I've done, and I've probably shown you or gone through some of the, the general settings that you can use to configure Oasis, so it's configured to the way that you would like it to work. 
And here we can get it to load things like your default menus. So later we'll take a look at maybe building a menu, and you could put your menu name in here and then get it to load. This is where you can set your color tables. If you don't like the color tables that uh, we use as our default, this is where you can then go and browse and open up one of the many other color tables that we have available as part of Oasis. You can set your units that the default system will use. If you do not specify projections, people ask me sometimes, well, when are these units used? I always go and tell it when I'm specifying my projections. It says it's unknown, and I have to tell it there. If you do not specify your projection, the units which are here are what is used when uh, working with the databases. You can go next and go on to set things like your default grid format, or your input and output. Perhaps the client that you're providing the data for always want data in one of uh, a number of other formats that we um, provide. You could then set your default output format, perhaps be to an ER mapper, for example. And then you can always, when you're creating the grids and files for that, uh, as part of working on that data, they will be automatically saved in the ER mapper format, saving you the trouble of having to go and copy and convert them later on. I'll just finish that. And the other one I wanted to show you on the configuration was the advanced configuration. In the advanced configuration, some of the good ones, the ones that I like to always come in here and set, is the auto save time. Some people love the auto save, some people not so much, and they're happy with just going and doing the save. If you set your auto save time, so this was GX. And the settings advanced and set your auto save time to zero that little auto save will never pop up the default value is 30 minutes so you'll see there that there's three zero and you can go in and set that uh, time to be any time so time in minutes so zero will turn it off and any other uh, longer time, well, that's how often you'll see it. So maybe 60 minutes, once an hour, or whatever you uh, prefer to work with. The other one that's a handy one in here is if you scroll down this list, and there's a setting there called image settings. The image settings here allow you to configure how the, the Geosoft grids are coming up. And one of the form settings that you can set here is whether to display the created grids. You know, when you create a grid, it automatically pops up in a window and you get to see it. Well, maybe in your workflow that's not something that you would uh, want it to do, that you're always putting them onto a map. So if you come in here and set this setting to false, you then... Well, they will not automatically pop up for you, and you can just open them and display them on the maps uh, if you prefer that as part of your workflow. In the next release that's going to be coming out in a couple months, there will also be an additional setting in here that you can set to display your grids as a shaded relief grid automatically when they are displayed. So right now, they're just displayed as a, like a single gridded image. Um, and if you want the shaded relief, you have to go and do that. Well, there'll be an option in here, same as similar as this display created grids. There'll be a display of the created grids as a shaded relief, and be able to select that as a true or false as well. So we've got a project open, and we'd like to get some data or load some databases into that. Well, we could come over onto our database menu, and you can right click. And you could say add a database. And then browse from one of the, I've uh, provided a, a couple databases to everybody. There was an APG, one that um, many of you have seen before as part of our uh, UX process workshops that uh, we run. And you can just simply click on one of these and then it will open it up and add it in the project, add it to the project explorer list and open it up for you. But you don't have to go up to the database list. Perhaps you already see your databases in Windows Explorer. So if you've got a, um, I guess a Windows Explorer 
File Explorer window open, you can simply browse down and find any one of the files. So I'll grab that Mac one. So I'll browse and find a database here. I can simply drag, holding down my left mouse button, and drop it into my open project, and then it will automatically open it and add it to that project. So I can do that from a Windows Explorer from any file folder on my hard drive. You can also do the same with any grid that you might have. Or with any map that you might have created as well. And I add a little map. Uh, there's my Bitimio app. So I can just drag and drop those into. From the Windows Explorer, you can simply drag and drop these files into your project and then they will be added to and open as part of the project. So for each of the databases, grids, and maps. I'm just going to close a couple of these. We'll come back to those later. One of the other drag and drop ticks is handy and helpful is here I have an empty database. And I would like to import my XYZ. XYZ is a, one of the most common file formats in uh, when working with the geophysical data that many of our um, field collection software can export that data. And you can find your XYZ file. And I created myself a little one here, and I just called it EM61. And if I drag and I can drag and drop that also from my Windows Explorer into an empty database or into a um, open GeoSoft database, GDB, and then that file will be imported into the database, just like if you had gone through the XYZ import and accepted all of the defaults. So there's some of the uh, drag and drop tools. Now if I'm making a map, perhaps I'm coming up to map tools and I've scanned my data here and I'll just call this one mag and I've made myself a new map. And I'd like to plot my grid onto that map. I could come over to my project explorer and there's the mag grid that we imported a few minutes ago into the workspace by just simply and dragging and drop it. I can also take that mag grid from the Project Explorer and drag and drop it into the map, and it will be automatically displayed and shown as part of that map. I could have also done the same thing from my Windows Explorer dialog. I could have found that same mag grid and dragged and dropped it in here too, and then that will import it into that map as well. One of the other, and I guess one of my final drags and drops, is you can take a database. And if you take a database and drag and drop that onto a map, it will plot the symbol plots for the points in that database. So basically it runs through and uses the default symbol plotting routine or location plotting. So many of us probably go into line path, symbols, location, plot, whenever we want to plot where our st uh, survey stations were. Well, you can save yourself that tra um, traveling, if you would, by simply just grabbing the database from the Project Explorer and dragging and dropping that onto the map. And then the symbols will be then displayed. So we're on the map. And we're wanting to um, perhaps zoom in. There's some features in this on this map uh, that um, I might want to zoom in onto. So I could use things like my roller ball on my mouse. So I've got one of those roller wheels on the mouse, and as I roll the wheel back towards myself, it zooms in on the map. Now that I've zoomed in, perhaps I want to go out to the full map and see the whole thing. So then I could just hit the F key is the one for full map. So you're like, well, how do you remember all this? 
For the keystrokes, if you right mouse click on a map, beside each of the commands there, you can see that there's a letter. So I just right clicked on the map. Those letters are the quick keys. So whenever you're kind of forgetting and going, oh, I think Darren said there was a quick key to do something on a map or whether it's the 3D view, you can right mouse click and see and uh, there's a little reminder there of the quick keys that you can use. So there I used the F key to zoom out to a full map. The other way that you can go and find some of this information are these tricks and tips. Um, if those of you who did download the data set, there is a PDF in there of the, where'd mine go, called OM Quick Reference. And this Quick Reference Guide is a PDF that you can use, print out, paste it on your wall, um, that will list all of what the icons do and what each of these quick cuts are. So if I scroll down, and there's the... Uh, the one for the map layout, there's the same F and zooming to a full map. So the other, one of the other things I uh, like to use when I'm working with my maps is the view group manager. And the quick key for that is the M key. And that will pop open the view group manager and it may be a, a floating window. You can float all of these things like the view group manager. You can take the project explorer and many of the other sort of modeless toolbars and, and float them. So if you're using a dual screen, and I won't do that to, uh, to you guys today because you can only see one of my screens, but I could move these over onto my second screen, allowing my main monitor for more space to better view my databases and maps. Or you can choose to place them and have them dock either at the left, right, top, or bottom of your monitor. I tend to like my view group manager docked up here on the, the top right. The view group manager is handy because it allows you to instantly get access to your databases. So when, have you ever been on a map and you're like, well, I'm trying to select this specific group or you're trying to pick a group to, to edit it or do something and you're finding that you've got many groups and it's just difficult to, to get hold of that on, on the map, then the easiest way to do to get to that or solve that problem is open your view group manager and then the lists are simply there. You can come on, you can turn them on and off by clearing the check marks. And when you select a group, you can go in and edit them or if it's in the case if it's an aggregate or a grid on a map, if you hit the edit button, you then can bring up the color tool. So some easy ways if you're finding to select those things difficult on the on the maps. And I'm not quite done with my drag and drops. One of the other things that you can do when the map with your maps, here I have another map of a, another data area. And perhaps I want this data or this gridded data set onto the same map as this other one. They're kind of uh, maybe making some kind of regional map. I can simply go up to my view group manager when I have that open and select that grid. And I can drag and drop that onto my other map. And if we just zoom out, and they're probably a little small on your screen to see them. Um, I should have maybe pick two that were closer. The, the two grids are available, but they're just uh, a little too far. And I'm seeing on my monitor that they're not quite showing up uh, so well on my view of what you're seeing. Uh, but they're there. They're at the two upper, two sides of my uh, my window. Now, how often has somebody sent you a map and or perhaps you want to send somebody a map and you want them to go and have a look at a feature of something of some interest? And I'll make this one bigger so you can see. And even still, I made this map 
but a little bit bigger, but it still may be difficult for you to see that, you know, there could be an interesting anomaly on this data set down over here. Now, if you want me to zoom in there, you um, could place your cursors at the location, and as I move my cursors, I can look down to the bottom right of my screen, and I see that there's a status bar, and on the status bar, we're displaying the current coordinates of that point which is great, but if I've got a nervous twitch or I've had a little bit too much coffee today, then getting those numbers could be a little bit more fun. Whenever you want the numbers from a map, all you have to do is hit enter. When I'm in the shadow cursor mode. And when I hit enter, a dialog will pop up that will allow you to either specify the exact position if you're zooming in somewhere or drawing something, or if you want to get those coordinates, um, there they are. I can copy and paste them out of the little dialog that pops up, and then put them in an email, send them to my, my coworker that I want them to have a go and look at this feature. But that, again, is still, it's still a bit of work. You've got to go in there. You've got to hit enter. You've got to hit copy, paste. How could I just get him to just zoom in and look at this area? Well, probably I would have zoomed in, and I'm going to use my B for my box key as one of my quick bars, or maybe I'm going to use my rollerball, and I could zoom into this map, into this feature. I then can on get to the map snapshot tool and create myself a snapshot. So there, you can see on the right pop-up, there's create a snapshot. And we could make a snapshot of something like, Bob, look here. So I pack up my map, I send it off to Bob. Bob opens it up, and he's like, hmm, Darren wants me to look at something on this map. He can either right-click on the map, and then there will be a list of all the snapshots. And he can say, oh, you must be want me to look here. He clicks on that, and instantly the map will zoom right into wherever I had located. So maybe we're zoomed out. Bob's looked in. He's looked at something else. And he's gone and picked an area in here, and he, he's been looking at that area. And he wants to create a snapshot, so he creates another snapshot. Joe, go here. And he creates that snapshot. So Joe gets it. He right-clicks, goes to create a snap, goes to snapshot, sees that, and, and goes into that area. Or maybe you make a type of spelling mistake. In the map menu, not only can you create the snapshots, but you can manage them there as well. So a variety of the, I can rename, I can delete. So we could get rid of the one that said Bob look here and delete that one. I could rename the Joe look here and get my case or whatever misspelling mistake I had made corrected by using this manage snapshots under the map toolbar. A useful tool that works in, uh, I find works in coordination with the, uh, sometimes with the map, snap sh uh, the map snapshot tool, is the auto recolor tool. And on the toolbars, that's this button right here. It's kind of got two colored squares. And how often has somebody sent you a map and perhaps you've zoomed into an area that you have an area of concern, like I've zoomed into here, and you're like, it's all green. Did whoever was doing the data processing and creating the grid make up this? color scale appropriately and are showing all the details in the data, or did they 
expand the green or expand whatever color that you're looking at so that you end up hide, hiding features that you can't clearly see. Now, yes, you could come and you could open up the color image tool and you could adjust it. Or if you come up here and select that colored button, which is called Auto Recolor Grids, when you click that button, the image will automatically recolor to show you the most dynamic range in that, day, in that window. So you can see there, there's a small high quite clearly in the middle of the area that I'm looking at. So when you uh, scroll out of the, on the, with autocolor on, as you move in and out of your map, you will notice the colors will appear to change. So when we were zoomed in, we could see the high detail and the high dynamic range of the area that we're looking at. And what the autocolor does, it applies the color ramp that you designed for your whole area, but only to the data is within that window. So as you zoom out, you will see the colors change because you're now incorporating more and more data in the window. Or whenever you incorporate the maximum and minimum of the data set within the window, then you will see the color ramp um, looking like you do without the auto recolor on. So it's a handy way of being able to see the details in an area that you've zoomed in without having to go out and uh, recolor zone or change the, the, the color of the gridded data set. The maps are saved with the uh, the map snapshot, sorry, are saved with the map, so wherever you send that map. And don't forget to always pack your maps when you do send them to somebody. Packing the map includes the grid files as part of the map. Um, so that when they, the person uh, receiving that map gets it, they can see the grid files without you having to include them um, separately on the file. They can also unpack the map. Some of the handy ways that people use the unpack and pack map feature is that when they're processing their data, they then choose to pack up a map that puts the grid files into it. Then they copy those maps um, into the final, some final directory and perhaps then unpack them, having only the maps and the final gridded data sets in there and not some of their working data sets and use that as a nifty way of uh, moving files around for themselves. Darren, with the, the packed map, we actually had an, a question from the audience with regards to being able to drag and drop a packed map. Are you able to do that from the Project Explorer? Drag things into my packed map? Yes, I believe so. I... Let's give it a try. I think you can. I haven't tried that one personally in a while. Then when I save that map, then that will be packed in as part of it. Okay. And can you just point out um, in your Project Explorer the file type that you're able to drag and drop? We just have someone in the audience that's trying to drag and drop the, um, the APG underscore mag underscore blind grid, and it doesn't seem to be working for them. So if you could just point out the file name and the file type and... Um, and which file you should be, because I know there's a couple different grid files that come up. You can gr drag and drop, depending on where you're dragging from, you can, from Windows Explorer, you can drag and drop all our file types within the Oasis workspace or within the Oasis project. And then that adds them as part of the project. If you want to, you can also drag a grid file onto a map either from Windows Explorer or from the Project Explorer so you see how that the the grids are, are listed here and then you drag and drop that onto your map then it will be displayed so depending on your grid long as it's met excuse me as long as it's matching the the data area that you use to design um, or create that map like if I drag the, uh, if I create a grid for the Aberdeen APG data and drag it and drop it onto here, it won't display, um, well it will display, but it just will be very, very small because this is in um, northern Ontario and the other stuff's down in Maryland, so uh, quite a distance apart. 
Okay, thank you for that. And if you have a GIS shape file, can you drag and drop that from your Project Explorer, your program, your um, Windows Explorer, sorry? Not the shape file, but if you open an MXD, um, we can open and grab layers from the MXDs and drag and drop those in between the maps. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much for that. If you load your shapefile, just I guess one other thing is you can load a shapefile directly in. So when you import, um, using one of our import tools that will then place your shapefile on a map, you could then drag from the map that displayed the shapefile to your other maps. And one thing to mention, whenever we're doing all this dragging and, and dropping around the maps, um, the files are being reprojected on the fly. So when I take a map, an image that could be in UTM zone 17 and drag it onto a map that's um, Lambert conformal projection, the, the image will be automatically reprojected to map, match or land geographically correct on that new map. One comment as to why not, why not always pack the maps because mm -hmm. they're always there. The reason why you don't all want to always pack your maps is because then the grid file will be duplicated. For example, this grid that we're looking at right now happens to be about one meg in size. So if I had this grid displayed on several maps, let's say five, then I'm using up five megs or more of my hard drive space. In the normal procedure, when the map is unpacked, the map, the grid is kind of referenced in to that map, so it is only stored on the hard drive once and then is linked into many other maps. So I'm not using um, my hard drive space up um, unneedlessly. For one of my other tricks and tips, so we say I'm just going to minimize this map. And here's a database, you know, some 61 data. It's got many, many columns in it. And often I get people asking me, well, how can I rearrange these columns? They'd love, if we, love it if we had a way to just kind of, you know, drag columns around. But unfortunately, we don't uh, within our database structure. But some ways that you can get around that is a shortcut key to hiding a channel. So everybody knows hiding a channel doesn't remove it from the database. It just temporarily um, hides it from view. If you select a channel header, so the top of the channel header in the uh, database, and then normally you would come up, right click, and then you might say hide a column. That's a bunch of clicks. I have to right click and come down and then say hide and select hide a column. Or I could just select the column and hit my space bar button. So there I just click my space bar and that instantly hit the column for me. I can also use my delete key and you can see these shortcuts are displayed. Uh, there's the, the letters there at the side of the pop-up menu. So I can hit my delete key and get rid of that empty column. So uh, a way that you can hide a bunch of columns is just I'm just hitting my space bar and then hitting my delete key to hide those columns up. And perhaps you're, you know, you're working away, you've got this kind of laid out, and you're like, oh, that's nice. And then I display and I show my profiles. And I was using this database earlier and I put it into the wrong window. So let me just remove it from that profile and put it in this profile. And maybe I'll do this with a couple of these channels. Maybe I'll put it back down in one of these windows and have one of them showing. Maybe there's a bunch of other channels. We may even go up to the top window and control the Y-axis option. So here I right-clicked in the window and I could set my Y-axis options to make sure that the same scale for all the profiles. You might even come in here and say, look, show me everything with your data that you're working on, show me everything from minus 10 to 50. 
because um, that's a, a range that you like to, to look at the data to see the numbers that you're interested in. You're like, all right, do I have to load this every single time I load a database? Wouldn't it be neat if we could just remember all that? And we can. If you come up to database, you can save something called a working view. So we can give this view a name. I know. How about my view one? This saves a small text file in your part of your project folder. We hit OK. Now that is being saved. Uh, prior to the class, I saved my everything done, so I could kind of refer it back to my other view of all my things displayed. That is what we started with. And I could come back and load the view that we had just saved. So there is part of the working view. It saves what channels are displayed both in the database and what channels are displayed in the profiles and how are the profiles arranged or what's the, the axes that are set for the profile. So the scaling and those parameters as well. So you can save, um, you, perhaps maybe you might have multiple working views with or without profiles. You can save those and put them in somewhere on your, you know, your hard drive or your computer in a toolbox that you can go to without having to go through the, the steps of having to load and set and control, having to go through and create all those parameters. There are text files. You can actually go and open up and edit them if you do want to tweak any of the parameters in that. Um, and if you, it's pretty straightforward if you want to uh, to give that a, a try. Any questions um, on the scripts and, and not the scripts, sorry, the shortcuts and the things that we've gone through so far? If you would like to um, can you either type in the questions into to Dima and she can uh, speak for you or if you want to you can raise your hand and uh, we'll unmute you so that you can uh, speak and ask your questions. We do actually um, have a question with regards to the automated scripts, but we can address that maybe a little bit later. It's just um, with regards to um, if there's a program that it recommends that um, GeoSoft works better compatibility with. So for the automatic script programs uh, running in Windows, such as Win Automation, I don't know if you're familiar with that, Darren. No, I can't say I'm familiar with that. We'll be getting into the scripts next, and that yeah. is di completely different to uh, as I'd have to probably maybe take that one uh, after the session. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you guys don't have any questions, I have a question for you. Let's see if this opens and works for us. How many of you have created a script or a custom menu before? And I'll let you share it so that you can see that a uh, good range of people. Um, so if some people have never done it occasionally. And we've got a few uh, pros in the crowd, so hopefully I can uh, give you all a little something interesting today. And uh, feel free to, if you have any sort of tricks and tips of your own, if you'd like to share them, I'm sure that uh, everybody will be happy to hear those. So when it comes to working with the scripts, scripts are really easy to do. You have something to do, press record, and you do it. And the script is created. We have our own scripting engine. So some of the things that you uh, might like to do, I know often that people, for example, uh, when they're working with the EM61 data, they like to work with the sum channel. They like to add each of the responses up and then plot that grid. As, as part of their workflow. So let's start with, uh, in this case, an example of perhaps you know, just doing 
the, the math expression, and then we'll take a look at the different components that make up part of the script. So generally when I'm working with writing scripts, the first thing I do is, well, I generally know what I kind of have in mind, so I might go through and create uh, a script. So we said we want to add it up our channels here. So I'm going to go database tools, channel math, and I can just use the math tool and we'll add up. So I'm just going to add in oops, an expression here. I could save this expression. That's something else I could have done. Uh, as an expression file down in here, given this a name, and then saved it. And then I wouldn't have had to uh, go in and, and type it in. But it's a pretty easy one, so I don't mind typing it. So we'll create a math expression. So you would go through something like this. And you would perhaps, you know, especially if it's a repetitive process where you're going to be doing things a number of times, you probably want to kind of, you know, go through that process for either a small portion of the data or for some of the data once just to kind of, you know, get that workflow um, consolidated in your mind. This is a pretty easy one. We're just doing a sum. So there we go. We've done the sum. So now, I said this is going to be something I want to do every single time, so I don't want to have to uh, go through that. So I'm going to record a script. So you simply come up to either this green triangle, just in the middle of my screen, under the word Seek Data. You see a little green triangle pointing to the, to the right. Or also under the GX menu, there is a script menu here. Uh, sorry, not the green triangle. We want to go to the right triangle here, sorry, uh, to do the recording. So our first step is to record our script. So you just press the record button. We'll come down, select it from the menu, give it a name, call this sum one, hit save. Now everything that I do, or almost everything that I do, will be recorded into a script. So I can come up here, and I could come up to Database Tools, Channel Math, and run it again. Or one of the other tips is that most things that are created as part of your menus are on maps. If you select either the object on the map or the channel in the database and right-click, at the bottom of the pop-up is something that we call the maker. So up comes the expression builder. From the maker, it will re always remember how that thing was created. So there is quite handy when I'm making the scripts, because especially when I'm working in the database, I will then work through. I might run a, a variety of different tools, testing different things. But the way that that was last created, that's what the maker is going to have remembered or will remember for me. So there's my math expression, so I can hit OK. And there, that's gone and has been recorded in as part of my script. Now, we said we'd like to grid this up, so why don't we uh, jump in and do that? So we'll, I'll just come up to grid an image. Remember, my script recording is still going. So I'll come up to minimum curvature. I'll pick that sum channel that we did, give it a name, choose my cell size, maybe call this sum all or something and say OK. And then that will go off and, and create that grid. And there's the sum of the grid. That's some grid. So now I'm going to stop recording my script. So up on your toolbar you'll see a red square. Or you can go to the GX menu and it will be there as well. And there we go. If you've been following along, we've just recorded a simple script. If we wanted to run that script, we just come to the green triangle, press the green triangle, and then we can browse, give it our script name, sum1, hit OK, hit run. And then that script 
will go and run. It'll create the sum channel and create and display that grid for you automatically. Let's take a look in that script. So I'm just going to go up to the run script because one of the things that you'll probably want to do is change things working as part of the scripts. There is an edit script button on that dialog that will open up the script in your selected text editor. So here it's open up for me in Notepad. I'm just going to, um, I use Notepad regularly because with, because that's what everybody's got and this is what it would look like in Notepad. I'm going to open the script up also in just using my Windows Explorer. Um, I have another two or, uh, what do you want to call it, another editor that I, I like to use um, called Notepad++. It allows me to uh, do a couple things here for you. One, zoom up the screen so that you can see the text a little bit larger and also color code things so that you can uh, see these things a little bit more easily on the screen here this afternoon. So there's three main components to a script. C current lines, which I've highlighted here in cyan. <clears throat> Set I and I lines, which I haven't highlighted at all, just there as a text, and the GX line that's highlighted in red. There's also some lines at the top and bottom with a slash in front of them. Those are comment lines. So comment lines are just ones that you can write whatever you want after the slash as to what this script does. Um, when you're recording them, we record the date and time of when you log that in in case you want as part of that. Um, but you can go and add whatever comments script to create some channel or something like that. So that when you come back and you're wondering later, well, what this does does. And you can insert them wherever you would like along down the script as well. The current lines, they control what database or what map is being used as part of the script. So it's like when you go over and when you're working with Oasis and you double click on the Project Explorer and you see that that database or map is, is bold in the Project Explorer or it's front and center, that is, has selected it and has made it your current database or map. Uh, typically. And similarly in the script we need a way to do that and that's what the uh, the current lines are doing in here. Now if you're trying to use this script and you want to be able to use this like you know I don't want to always have a database named uh, APG M61 whatever you can comment them out and then it's up to the person running the script to make sure that they have selected the correct database. So long as the script does not need to change um, databases as part of its running, like for example, pick up uh, the MAG database and then do something, then grab the EM database and do something else, as long as you don't need to do that, then you don't need the current lines in there. The set INIs, well that's just everything that we typed into our dialog. So you'll see there's my math expression. There's the expression file that I used because I was going to save it. These each of the expression variables and then the channel that that refers to. And then you have your GX line. The GX line, that's just like when you hit OK on the um, dialogs that you're telling it to go ahead and do it. So that is the part that runs the execution. So I'm going to edit the script and I'm just going to take out uh, the, the current lines here since I don't need to change between. And then there I have the uh, settings for, for the gridding. Now if you're ever wondering 
Well, what does CS, randgrid.cs mean? Now, sometimes they're quite obvious, and you look at them, and you go, oh, CS, that might mean cell size. Or the value that you typed in there, you can go, oh, yeah, that must mean it's the channel, the grid, or the name of the file, or something like that. And you might be able to make a guess at it, but perhaps you can't. And you're trying to understand what they, they mean. Whenever you're using one of our tools, so if I come back and look at the gridding, and I bring up the help for the gridding. You see below each of the parameter that sections in the help, it will say script parameter, and then it will tell you what that code means. So that's how you can then go figure out um, where is the cell size in the script. Well, look for Rangrid CS, or scan through here and find what Rangrid CS means, and you'll see there that it represents the script, the cell size. So we could edit this, and maybe I'll change this to 0.2. You can go through and edit in, in the script, and then just remember to save it. And then when you close your file, we can then just come back, and we can rerun it. And then that script will go off and do whatever series of tasks that we asked it to. And if you don't believe me, I can bring up the properties. So I've just right-clicked on the grid in the Project Explorer. It's a quick and easy way to get to the, the properties or the metadata in that case for a map. So I wanted to look at the properties. And we can see there the properties for this grid has changed to 0.2. I did mention that most of the things that you will create or run just by running the commands will be recorded into a script. There is a few exceptions, and those are ones that are related uh, directly to the, the database. And they are database functions, or as opposed to running the GX, so there are separate commands to load and use those. And you can see those listed on the script menu, on the, the GX script menu. And it mainly revolves around creating channels hiding them or displaying them, load or unload, and deleting channels from the database. Uh, if you use the key sequence that you do, like to create a channel where you just type in the database header, or if I come up and right click on the database, like if I want to delete this sum channel, and I come up here and right click and do the delete, that does not get written to the script. I would have to use these commands in through here um, to, to do those steps. Now we can pass variables into our scripts. by using, and that's when, when you run the script, this name parameter is one of the, uh, the ways that you can use the thing. Say, let's I wanted to try a bunch of different cell sizes when I was gridding this up. I could edit my script. I'm going to copy out the whole line with the uh, um, with a set and I in is for the, the grid cell size. And before I leave and save this, I'm going to comment out that line. Because if that line is still there, it will always use what's in the script file as opposed to the value I'm passing to it. So I comment it out. I then save and close my script file. And then over here, I can put in that parameter that we were wanting to use. So that's why I just do the copy-paste. I find that that's a very simple and easy way of getting that parameter that I wanted. You could just go in and, and type it into and, and copy out the lines that you wanted. So now, rather than me having to always open up that script, 
I can come in here, change this variable, and now run the script. And it will be recreated with the new cell size. That's a sort of an easy sort of a starting way of passing the variables into the script. The next way that we can use to pass variables in is using the DOS prompt. Before I move on to that, was there any questions with the scripting so far? Darren, you mentioned um, that there are some things that you can't do as a script if you were to, let's say, hide a channel. Um, can you pull a like um, a saved database view within yep. the script? You could use the. We could have saved. Yes, we could save the this database view that can be saved in as part of one of our script commands, yes. Okay, so you can get the saved view as part of your script as well. And yes. you, what you about... You can hide a channel, just to kind of clarify that one. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I wasn't uh, completely clear on that. When I hide a channel on here, if I right-click and say hide a column, I can do that through my script, but I just have to, I can't do it by right-clicking and saying hide. If I wanted to hide the sum channel as part of my script, I would come, while I was recording my script, I would need to come over here and say unload a channel. Okay. And then so that would be recorded into the script and that I could actually do, I don't have to do it as part of a script, but if I say, if I say unload sum, you'll see there it, sum now has disappeared. Okay, so it doesn't recognize some of the shortcuts, for example, the space yes. bar, things like that. And what if you you had a map open and let's say, for example, you wanted to record zooming into a specific area. Does the script recognize any kind of motions like that? Uh, no, the script doesn't recognize the, the zooming um, in and out on the map, but you could get it to load a snapshot. Okay. And when you're building these scripts, <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the functionalities have um, like a, a file name that gets created. Will mm -hmm. your scripts continuously overwrite those file names? So let's say you're creating a grid in the script. Every time you run that script, will it overwrite your previous yes. script? Yes. If, if I, like in my script here, I call this one sum all. Every time I run this script, it is going to be, yes, overwriting my some all grid. Okay. Now it is going to the um, this dot slash slash means it's going into my local folder. Okay. So it's not you can control by typing in paths if you want to manage your fi your grids into different locations um, by including the path statement. So or not including it, depending on how you want to uh, to operate. Sometimes you don't want it; you just want it to always work inside the local project folder. Then, um, by just putting dot slash slash, that is just inside the current folder or current uh, project folder. To help you in the data set that I uh, sent out, I created a little batch file. And um, if you've got that, or I can open it and show you what's in the batch file. The batch file is a Windows command that will set the current DOS window to your project folder when you run it from which whenever wherever you run the batch file from, it sets the command prompt window that it opens up to that file. So it saves you having to go and do the change directory. It also adds the um, montage folder to the um, path folder. And if you're old enough to remember having to set paths, you used to always have to tell the DOS well, where to look for the program files. So we need to tell it to look inside a, a specific folder and have that added to. 
You could go and modify your path statements as part of your environment variables if you did not want to have to go and set this each time. Um, I just wrote says this is a little batch file that I sort of hand out to people that I work with because then they can just use it. They've always got their um, file set and it saves you says having to do the, the change path. So if you are you sort of coming along, if you just double click on the little batch file that I've got there is called set path start DOS. It will open a DOS window up and it will put me into my current folder my current project folder. Uh, otherwise, I think if you do it from like the command line, it puts you into my documents, and then you would have to use things like change directory CD to navigate your way through your uh, directory tree to wherever your data is located. Now I'm going to take our same little batch file script that we were working with and I'm going to make it so that I can pass the cell size into it from a DOS batch file. And um, make it so it's kind of a little bit more editable and a little bit more easy to use. So I've opened the... Uh, file here just in my editor again. I'm going to uncomment that line with the cell size into it. Darren, since you're on the, the comment lines, is there a way for you to comment out a block without having to put the backslash on every single line? Uh, not in the script engine, no. You'll need to... Okay. Uh, Do it individually for every each, line? Each, in, each individual, yeah. Yes, that's okay. Right. Thank you. So now we need to tell it uh, with the batch file version in the DOS uh, window, we can give it actual variables. And so I'm going to make a variable up here, and I'm just going to call it, you know, cell size. Now, case doesn't matter. Uh, it's case insensitive. But you do need to delimit what the variables are. And it's double curly brackets or parentheses is what you need to put around whatever you want to use as your variable. So I could have it changing either part of um, a file name, perhaps. I could have it, um, in this case, replacing the, the cell size. Um, it's a literal, whatever I type in until it's equal to this variable, it will be placed um, in that position in the file. And just in case somebody asks me a question to try it later, I'm going to call this one someone DOS. So there we go. We've got our script. We've got our variable into our script. And we want to be able to use it for our unattended if um, a DOS way of, of running the scripts. I'm going to also want to make sure that my database in this method is also available. Uh, because I'm going to set this up to run in an unattended mode, um, I need to be able to have the script know what is the current database that I want this to, to run on. So I've uncommented my current line as well. Okay? So I'll just save that. And because I'm going to run unattended, I'm going to close my project down so that we can use it as part of running unattended. So if we go project, I'm just going to say close and save all my project. So now I'm back to my DOS window. The command that we need to write here is called OMS, on, uh, Oasis Montage Scripting Engine. So if you just type OMS, and if you type it without any anything else after it, that's how you can bring up the help for it. So if you just type OMS at the DOS prompt, providing that your path has been select, set correctly, you will see a little help pop up, and it should look something like we've seen here. And I'm going to run it where I need to, uh, says we want to run it in unattended mode. 
and we'll get it to uh, we'll give it our project file and then we'll give it the uh, the script file that we want it to run and then um, the the variables that we we want it to do so we just need to type OMS and my project was called opti1 let me just double check that yep and if you want to help yourself remember, sometimes I, I'll put the extension on the end of that. And then we need the script file. My, excuse me, I want to type in my script file first. So it's someone-dos.gs. The script file that we wanted to run, and then the project file that we want it to run on, which makes sense, because you grab the script file that you want to run, and then, well, what are the things that you want it to, to act upon? So we want to grab our Opti1 project file. Um, we then want it to pass the cell size down, because that was the thing that we had sent as our variable. So then we need to type in our variable. So we just called it, I called it cell size. I've used all uppercase, but as I mentioned before, um, it is case insensitive. And then I can type in a cell size. So I think we would used, um, I will make it run quick. We'll just put in one meter as a cell size. So it's OMS, then the name of the script file, the name of your project file, and then after that, separated by spaces, what uh, are the variables that you may be uh, using? And then you just simply press OK. And then it will start the Oasis Montage Script in Edgy. Our script will run, and faster than I can say it, it's created the sum and um, calculated the grid and save that as part of the project. It will give you a dialog as you can see there. This one took 2.97 seconds. Um, you can choose what it's going to display. It's giving you some ranging information about the gridding in this process. Um, you can choose to turn that off if you would like. And that's running the, uh, the script files from the, from the DOS prompt. I find that that's an easy way of being able to pass the variables in because I can create a batch file with that OMS line in. I think I've, I've provided an example of that in the, the data set that I handed out. Um, that's called uh, OM, OMS, OM DOS script that will give you an example of uh, another script or just some uh, files that I was using uh, with that similar cell size type example. So if you had to do uh, multiple things like different gridding up different data sets, you could use um, that variable that you'd be passing down to be the name of your channel and then generate and build some batch files to automate that further. If you do want to create more automation or have um, dialogues um, for your scripts, um, that's getting a little bit more advanced and into a very um, basic um, GX type developing. Um, GX is um, the term that we use for GeoSoft executables. They're a C based, and um, we'll be. I can talk about you after this class about if you have interested. Uh, in being able to do that. Scripts can call another script. Um, if you call a script as part of a script, then the script that you're calling essentially gets embedded. Those commands get embedded inside the, uh, the calling script so that you can pass uh, things on. Any questions on passing through or running it from scripts from DOS? We do have a, um, a question. Um, one of the audience members has asked if there's a huge um, input variables, can one pass, just pass a file containing them? Um, no. That would be that kind of type of thing you would need to 
run probably from a GX. Okay, thank you. If you do have a large number of viable, um, variables, um, like perhaps I need to do this on many files, mm -hmm. I want to run something and the name of that grid file is, um, you can use things like the piping command from the directory. Okay. The, um, you know, if you take a dir star dot grd, will give you a list of all your grids. Mm -hmm. And if you add a slash b, that's called bear, and it only just gives you the file name. That uh, now I can edit that text file that we just uh, created, and you'll see that it'll just have a list of those. And then I've just done a search and replace and added in front of all of them the uh, commands to do the you know script and whatever script and project that you would have. And then that so, would be my variable. Someone also just commented that if you run the same script within a batch file and apply the, the file name to the variable, you can call and process a series of files, but they they all have to remain in the same directory. Good tip. And we actually have another great tip. Um, someone had mentioned just a program that they thought would be useful to some other people um, that are working with us. So I'm just going to unmute one of our members, and they're going to share the information with us. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you perfect. Uh, this is Skip Snyder down in Grand Junction. And I use a uh, tool that's uh, freely available through Microsoft called Command Here Power Toy. And I'm sure you can find it by uh, Googling. Googling it. And what it does is it installs. And when you right click on a, on a uh, folder, uh, you have a choice of opening a command uh, prompt or uh, a command window in the directory. So it effectively does the same thing as running the uh, 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 batch file that, that uh, Darren mentioned. Yeah, so yeah, there's, there's it on the uh, on the Microsoft website. Yeah. I can send that to all the audience members. And somebody actually also mentioned that apparently in Windows 7, you can shift right click to be able to do that. Thank you, Skip, for that. Thanks. So for my last trick this afternoon is being able to customize or create your own menus. So if you can write a script and you can understand scripts, menus aren't that much more difficult. I started creating a menu here, and for the very basic or, or for starting a menu, menus are composed of two things, uh, something that's called menu, uh, something that's called item. And if you want to get fancy, let's call a separator or a line across it. Uh, once again, slashes um, indicate comments. So here I've um, created a little menu, just called it Darren's Menu. The file extensions on them, if you are creating them just from a text file, do have the extension .omn. And then you can put so you type in the word menu, and this is the, what's going to appear on our menu. And then below that, we just put item, and then we put what we want to call or pull from the, the, uh, the, the menu. So you could, um, you might know of other GXs, or maybe you've got GXs that maybe uh, you have a friend or something has written as a GX. This is how you could build them on the menu. You also can or how I start building most of them, if I was going to build a custom menu, is if you browse into your Geosoft folder, there is an OMN folder. So program files, Geosoft, Oasis Montage, OMN. Within that are all the menus that come as part of Oasis Montage. I wouldn't recommend that you edit any of those because that might um, 
affect things um, in ways that you don't want it to happen. But you could go and you can open up these and um, steal, if you would, some of the command lines that we've got in there. You will find OMN files as they are the main menu files. You will find SMN files as they are submenu files. The structure inside them are um, the exact same. Um, a little bit more than we can cover here this afternoon, but you can have menus, have submenus with inside them, and we um, can help you build those. Um, but you can browse through your list, and like if you want to get, say, the gridding tools, if you come in and load and open up the grid and image menu, you can see there are all the items. So if I wanted to add trigging to my menu, I could just come and copy this line from my from this grid and image one to my menu file and add it in here. You can add your scripts to your menus. You just need to make sure that you place your scripts in a consistent location, of course, because you want to be opening the menus and that you have built your scripts um, in such a way that you you know you don't need to um, you're either making sure you're consistent with your naming inside the script as part of like you know, the files or channel names that you're using, um, or that you don't need the the database name as perhaps you remove that. And I created a folder, and I put it inside the user folder inside um, or on the Geosoft um, place. Just so then, whenever I uninstall or upgrade Oasis, the things in the user folder aren't going to get touched and um, accidentally deleted um, by a system operation um, doing an up during an upgrade or something like that. So I created a scripts folder in there, and then I just placed a, a script in there. The tip here is to save myself, you know, maybe if I share this menu with my friends, I could get them to all build their users folders and place things. But they may install Geosoft, some may install it on C, some may install it on D. If you put Geosoft inside less than, greater than signs, that's a shortcut key of using whatever the system path has for that uh, file. So then that knows to look for um, scripts in that, in that location. Steal menu items from somewhere else, or if I've got one that I wanted to, uh, maybe there's a GX. If you're wanting to go wonder, well, what GX is perhaps the low pass filter? In your free room, um, if you go onto a menu, that is in Oasis, you're inside Oasis, just like I'm sitting right here right now. I'm sitting on the low pass command. If I look down in the bottom left corner of my screen, the very bottom left corner of the Oasis montage window, you will see it says execute the, and then it will have the name of the GX. And in the case of this one, low pass is called lowpass.gx. So I could add to my script if I wanted to. We could go item and type in low low pass filter. And then to just type in the name of the GX that I'd like it to run. So you can either steal them from the menus that we've already created and copy them into your own, creating your own customized workflow, or just simply by sitting on the menu item in when you're in Oasis, you can then see the command that you're going to be running. So you've created yourself a menu, and you're kind of wondering if it works. Will it work if it works? If you come to either GX, and at the very top of the GX menu, there is load a menu. And remember, if you see an icon beside something on a menu, then that means there is an icon on a toolbar somewhere 
that you can load to do that exact same function. By default, it will start in the Geosoft Oasis montage. So Geosoft program, our program files, Geosoft OMN folder, where all our defaults are. But you can browse and browse wherever you have, oops, happen to have created the menu file. And where's the one that we've got today? There's mine. And uh, once that placed in the user folder, we change that. I saved it in two places. One to give you guys, and then one to load. There it is. And it will load beside the, um, your menu will load beside the seek data uh, next to window. And then there you can see the, the menu commands. If there's I just the wrong one. Uh, the menu commands that you have then loaded on here, or you can have whatever just things that you would like to de see displayed. So since I edited the wrong one, let's go and get that editing in the right menu. Just copy that over. So to talk a little bit more about the structure in here, the menu item will, that's whatever you see on the menu bar. So whatever you want to see in the toolbar in Oasis, that's what's inside the quotes um, next to the menu. Next you have item, and this is all the things that you want to see on the menu. Once again, followed by in quote is whatever you would like to see on the menu bar, followed by a comma, and then the name of the GX or the name of the script that you want to have um, activate or happen when you click on that menu uh, command. The rest of the, the spacing or anything like that I've got in here, uh, case, that doesn't matter. Um, so it's just Item, there is a space after that, I guess at least one, and then a comma um, in front of the actual GX. You can add in front of things if you want to use keystrokes uh, when you're using a menu, like if you don't have a mouse. If you put the ampersand, the letter that is the ampersand is in front of, that is the one that the um, will show up in a keystroke. So what I mean by that, I didn't load one in this case of this menu, but when I hit my Alt key, you will see like a little underscore appear under things in the menus. Um, so that then now if I hit the F key, it opens up the file menu. If I hit the E key or the P key, it will take me to project um, in the case of this example. Where was my there it is? So just save that in your OMN folder, and then you can then go and browse into your OMN folder, um, your custom menu, and load it up, uh, being able to create a, a customized uh, workflow. There's a few other commands. There's a number of the, uh, that can be used in when building the, the menus, about getting the menus to load in certain locations or unload. Um, other parts of our menu, uh, the default menu structure. Um, we can also go on to do this to set them, um, set toolbars. So sometimes um, the command that you might be doing, it might be more efficient to get it from a toolbar. It does follow a, a similar structure um, that uh, is probably a little too much for us to go into here this afternoon. So hopefully that has given you some ideas and, and some hints. Um, surely we'll, just, we'll open up the, the floor to sort of any questions. Um,
I guess just reminding that if any time that you have any, any questions about being able to access the, this material, um, there's always things like support that you can and have access. My last, you know, big trick or tip is uh, do not be afraid to contact or call support. Um, the even if you're working late or on some other time zone, um, all our support offices around the world are always kind of you know keeping an eye on or watching your support. So if you are out west and you have a problem late in the evening or late in the afternoon, don't be surprised that if you get a response from our Australian office, for example, um, uh, answering your support issues and questions. That you're not limited to just you know one or two calls a week a month. Uh, we do provide other training and other services. I can, um, Dima and myself can go through um, helping you build your menus or providing you training on how to do this. Uh, and if you'd like information on that or if you have other questions, um, feel free to um, either get in contact with us or Rena um, will be able to answer all of those uh, questions and help you out. So with that, I will... Thank you, Darren. Thank you very much, and thank you all. Um, on behalf of Geosoft, Darren, Dima, and I thank you for your time and, consider and consideration through attending this webinar. We hope that you walk away with some good time-saving tips on Oasis Montage to help make your workflow quicker and easier. Um, also, just a few additional comments. If you enjoyed today's workshop, you, as Darren mentioned, you may also be interested in uh, Geosoft's half-day or one-day online technical sessions uh, with our software experts. These are designed to work one-on-one -on -one with you and our trainers, and it focuses specifically on your project needs. We did have a few um, questions, Darren, if you don't mind um, addressing them. Um, I was just wanting to confirm that the um, the the menus, the Oasis Montage menus that you build, those are files that you can share with your with your colleagues or throughout the company. Is that correct? Yep. Just it, the the files OMN that I had it open here in my text file, um, and you can just yeah send it to whoever. You just need to make sure that they place it in their OM folder. If you are calling any scripts or other or your own custom GXs which you may have located in other than our standard folders that you do include that path um, in as part um, of as the item call so they just have to make sure that that matches what's on their machine. Okay and within your menu um, topics can you you know how for example if you're under the gridding menu and then there's under gridding there's minimum curvature cragging so can you actually have menus within menus under a custom menu or do they all tend to bulk up under the same menu? No, you can, within the menu file itself, um, the grid menu is a good example actually to bring up. Um, mm -hmm. One of the commands I didn't go into with uh, the main class, but you can what's called a, a sub-menu. Okay. And so you can see there, um, if you look in the, this is the grid and image um, menu file. Uh, you can see, so there we have menu that the grid and image is what we see displayed in our Oasis window up here. And then as you see in the gridding menu, when you click on it, there's little pop-out menus for each of the gridding and for the displays, and then it's sub-menu. And then if you scroll down in this file, you'll see there are another menu file that will be named exactly as the main menu file with a slash and then the name of your submenu name. Okay, perfect. And, and one one thing to caution: if you are going to be doing submenus like that, be very. Um, the biggest mistake I found when I make that is typos. Uh, if there's a typo in the submenu or the menu file, things don't work. Okay, and the um, the plot, the um, and sign key shortcut that you showed us, that's something that you can also incorporate into your custom menu. That's not just yep. a trait. Okay, just wanted to nope. confirm. I, I just didn't um, happen to have used it on, on uh, like if I click on my menu and bring up the alt, 
you'll see there the and sign is in front of the nonlinear and through the minimum curvature. Oh, fingers. But uh, yeah, we save that so we can refresh my menus. Um, and it will be incorporated in, in there as well. Wonderful. And just for those of you, um, GX, it stands for Geosoft Executable. That's just, I know we, we use that, um, that shortcut pretty freely. So those are you that don't know what it stands for. You will find in your, like everything that we're running here, um, apart from some of the newer tools, which are .NET, and they have a little more of a complicated name, um, they, they are running little little commands. There's a little tool there called gx dot, rangrid dot gx in the case of min curvature. This was. Thank everyone for uh, coming out, and hopefully um, we've answered your questions and um, given you some good ideas and ways that you can streamline perhaps your workflow.